Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Today's program is part of our MGFC Family Centered Care Series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General for Children. Before we get started, I just want to go a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, it'll be made available on the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum dash center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so you can hear our guest speakers today. If you have any questions for our guest speakers, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speakers will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'd be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next I would like to introduce you all to today's guest speakers. These are our guest speakers who are all whom work within the Department of Speech, Language and Swallowing Disorders and Reading Disabilities at Mass General. First, I'd like to introduce you to Danielle Karthik. Danielle is a bilingual pediatric speech language pathologist at the MGH Chelsea Healthcare Center. She specializes in working with people who stutter from early childhood through adulthood, as well as with young children with speech and language disorders in their families. Daniel also teaches graduate student clinicians as an adjunct lecturer on fluency disorders at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. Joining us today, we also have Courtney Perigo. Courtney is a pediatric speech language pathologist and reading specialist at MGH Revere Healthcare Center. She specializes in working with children who have language-based learning disabilities and fluency disorders across the lifespan. And lastly, we also have Jacqueline Toscano, Jacqueline is a bilingual Spanish-English speech-language pathologist at the MGH Healthcare Center in Revere. She specializes in stuttering, other fluency disorders, and multilingual language development. In recognition of International Stuttering Awareness Day, which was yesterday, they join us today to give a talk on breaking the stigma, exploring stuttering from early childhood through adolescence. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Amy, and to the Blum Center for having us, and welcome, everyone. And again, happy belated International Stuttering Awareness Day. Jacqueline, Courtney, and I are excited to share this time with you today to talk about this topic. Stuttering is something that we are each passionate about in our work and want to encourage more open discussion about it so that we can continue to break down the stigma that unfortunately still exists. It is also important to disclose that we are not people who stutter ourselves and that we are speaking from our clinical knowledge and experiences working with children who stutter in their families. To that end, our goals for today's talk are to define stuttering, debunk some common myths, discuss the development of stuttering in children leading to what caregivers can do to support a young child in this area, describe the impact of stuttering on individuals, especially as they move towards school age and adolescence, and provide considerations for those age groups. And finally, to share and explore what effective speech therapy goals look like versus ineffective or not beneficial goals. Lastly, we hope to leave you with some trusted resources that we recommend exploring if you'd like more information. So to start off the presentation, we want to discuss the term stuttering. And before we dive into that, we want everyone just to take a minute to jot down your own definition of stuttering or your background knowledge that you have on this topic. So we'll give it a minute or so. Okay, 
Thank you for jotting down uh, your ideas. So stuttering is a speech pattern in which the flow of speech is disrupted and results in stutter-like disfluencies when a person is talking. Though we all experience disfluencies in our speech, stuttering is characterized by physical tension or tightness in the speech muscles, such as our tongue, jaw, neck, or lips. There are different types of stutter-like disfluencies that we'll talk more about in just a bit. Stuttering can begin gradually or it can develop over time and appear suddenly. Stuttering is an individual experience that is not only impacted by these stuttering behaviors, but also impacts a person's overall experience when communicating with others across a variety of different environments, which may lead to feelings of shame, fear, embarrassment, or anxiety around speaking. So we think that it's important to hear about the experience of stuttering from a firsthand account um, from Ruben Palai, who is a person who stutters. And in this video, he provides a wonderful analogy involving a bridge and a river to highlight the complex nature of stuttering that encompasses not only stuttering behaviors, but also the psychological impact that stuttering can have. He opens the video by saying that his talk is specifically for those people who do not stutter. But this talk is for everyone else to help you better understand the challenges that we face. Everyone can see the physical struggle when someone is having a stuttering block but the psychological battle is still wildly misunderstood. The ancient Greeks, for all their wisdom, attempted to cure stuttering by having people speak with rocks in their mouth. They would even cut off pieces of your tongue to alleviate any visible tension. Fortunately for people like me, speech therapy and coaching has come a long way since then. In the next few minutes, I'm going to give you an insight into the mindset behind how it feels to have a stuttering block. Stuttering is like walking along an unreliable bridge. The bridge is your voice, and below is a river that you do not want to fall into. The deeper your insecurities and the lower your, lower your self-esteem, the deeper the river and the bigger the fall. As you walk along this bridge, step by step, word to word, you can feel the bridge creaking and tension rising. It's almost inevitable that you will fall into this river of shame, embarrassment, and previous negative experiences. You reach the first massive gap and freeze. Something is preventing you from making that next step, and the next word seems out of your reach. You take a deep breath and begin to jump, but hold back. You try again and again, and eventually you make that leap. You just about reach the other side, and you cling onto that sound for dear life to pull yourself up and over to complete that word. This process repeats itself several times a day. It can be mentally draining and very stressful. And as you get older, more difficult bridges await and big life decisions. You start avoiding. You avoid words, sounds, careers, relationships, and eventually life. Once I realized it was okay to jump into that river and face my insecurity, reveal my insecurity, my ability to express myself and be myself opened up. It's taken a long time, but I'm no longer afraid of stuttering openly in public. That was the key to my freedom. I took control of the narrative. And if you are facing an invisible struggle of your own, 
that could be the key to yours. If you happen to come across a person who stutters or anyone experiencing a visible or invisible challenge, just give them time to walk along their bridge and appreciate that there is a river beneath that you cannot see or fully understand. So I think this video is powerful because it provides concrete imagery to represent Ruben's stuttering experience as a whole, including avoidance of various speaking situations that have impacted his life trajectory. He also discussed the power of self-acceptance and renewed sense of control when he became increasingly comfortable with stuttering openly in public. There is no single cause of stuttering. It is important that we think about the language that we use when we talk about stuttering. Rather than using the term disorder to describe this speech challenge, as it diminishes the experience of people who stutter, we like to think of it more as an experience, difference, or a distinct style of talking. Stuttering is complex, and it's both neurological and physiological in nature. However, the cause of developmental stuttering is not considered to be psychological. There are many different factors that contribute to this speech pattern, including but not limited to difference in brain activity that impact the flow of speech and may be amplified by situational or emotional factors. Stuttering can also be passed down in families. Approximately 1% of the world's population stutters, meaning that there is a community of people of all ages who stutter in a variety of languages across the globe. Stuttering is about three or four times more common in males than females. So now that we have some background on stuttering, let's review some terms used in the world of stuttering. The term disfluency is a general word used as an umbrella term for all types of disruptions to the flow of speech. Non-stuttered, also known as typical disfluencies, are the disfluencies such as interjections or the words um or uh that even speakers who do not stutter demonstrate at times. Typical disfluencies tend to sound more relaxed than stuttered disfluencies. Atypical disfluencies are a special subset of disfluencies that, while more rare in general, are observed in some speakers, especially those with co-occurring diagnoses such as autism, ADHD, and even stuttering. Atypical disfluencies are not called stuttering, but they can occur in the same speaker. Some examples of an atypical disfluency would be a repetition at the end of a word, such as ball, all, all. Stuttered disfluencies will be discussed in the next slide, but they tend to signify stuttering, the experience, and convey more tension and irregularity in speech than typical disfluencies do. Our stutter disfluencies are commonly thought of primarily by what we call the core behaviors, which are the stutters we hear in a person's speech. However, secondary behaviors are important to consider as well. Core behaviors include three main types of stuttered disfluencies, repetitions, prolongations, and blocks. We have this visual of a winding road to help us conceptualize these three types. So let's think of a car driving along a road and the car approaches a series of speed bumps and it bumps along the road. We can think of these as the repetitions. For example, in the word all, it would sound like a, uh, a, uh, all, or all, all, all. The same car now approaches a hill and it treks up the hill slowly with a lot of force on the motor. This is our prolongation. 
Prolongations are elongated sounds that occur with building tension, such as in all. Finally, the car approaches a roadblock, a line of orange cones in the middle of the road and cannot move any further forward. This is our block. Speech is halted and cannot move forward, sounding like all. Secondary behaviors are the body's response to stuttering and can include avoidance of a moment of stuttering, such as saying um or uh, or escaping a moment of stuttering, which can look like avoiding eye contact or tapping one hand, one's hand or foot to get out of a moment of stuttering more quickly. Core behaviors often co-occur with secondary behaviors, though they can occur independently as well. During today's talk, we'll move through the development of stuttering from early childhood through school age and adolescence. Stuttering can look different at different ages and in different stages of life. And we will highlight those differences and how to support stutterers at those different stages. As a note, stuttering can of course occur through adulthood, though we will not be touching on that population today. As we get started with this conversation and throughout our presentation, we will be asking for your participation in debunking common myths about stuttering by completing some polls. So here's our first one. Stuttering is not related to intelligence. So you should see the first poll there. So please take a minute to respond whether you feel this is a myth or a fact. We'll give it a few more seconds before we end the poll. Thanks, Amy. All right, so thank you for your responses. It is indeed a fact that stuttering is not related to intelligence. And this is a very important fact to underline and reiterate if you're ever in a position to do so. It's been shown that people who stutter are still often overlooked for jobs or job promotions, et cetera, because of this inaccurate perception that people who stutter are not as intelligent or as capable as those who do not stutter. This is absolutely untrue and people who stutter show the same range of cognitive abilities, personality traits, and psychological profiles as those who don't stutter. So we have another one for you. Our next one is related to what causes stuttering, which we'll get to in, in a minute. So please take a second to respond, myth or fact, for the following statement. Stuttering is caused by being around other people who stutter. Give it a few more seconds before we close the poll. All right, 100%. So this is indeed a myth. As with most things, we often seek out a cause to explain something unknown or different, such as stuttering. So often clients or their family members may come to us and say something like, stuttering seemed to start after my child was around another child who talked the same way, and then they started to imitate it. So while it may seem like these things are related, there is no evidence to support this. Stuttering is not something that is learned. It is considered a neurodevelopmental disorder or difference that has a biological basis, which we'll talk about on the next slide. 
So I'm going to use this model to talk through what the research shows us about the causes of stuttering. And I say causes because we know, as Courtney stated, that there is no one thing that causes stuttering to develop in children. However, we do know that there are many factors that could contribute to the onset. So this model comes from the Palin Center for Stammering in England and is a model that can help us visualize the factors that could contribute for a child in the onset of stuttering. The Palin Center defines stuttering as a neurodevelopmental disorder involving many different systems active for speech, language, motor, and emotional networks. Each child is born with a genetic makeup that contributes to the probability of stuttering. However, whether stuttering develops depends on experience. So let's talk through this definition using the model here. So often the onset of stuttering in children is between the ages of two and five, when they're consolidating a lot of development in many areas. So for example, in speech and language, their emotional regulation, their motor development, et cetera. Fluency often becomes vulnerable because it is impacted by so many of these other domains. So in this model, the young child in the center, where you see physiological factors, these factors that may predispose a child to stuttering include a family history of stuttering, and we know that there is a genetic link, the sex assigned at birth being male, as more males stutter than females, and subtle differences in connectivity in areas of the brain associated with timing and coordination of speech. So those are those factors that may predispose a child to stutter. The other factors in the circles around the child that can also contribute to the onset are the child's abilities or profile in other areas of development. So these other areas can also impact fluency, such as the child's language and communication abilities. So other language delays or disorders or advanced language skills can also be factors impacting fluency. Also, speech and motor abilities. So children that have greater difficulty with articulation or subtle differences in their ability to quickly coordinate their speech can be at higher risk. The third one is psychological factors. So a child's temperament can also impact their fluency. Children that have more reactive or sensitive temperaments and less adaptability to change may react with more tension to situations where other children would not. So all of these factors can contribute to stuttering in children and they're unique to each child. So not every child will experience all of these factors. Finally, you'll see that influencing all of these things is the environment. So factors in the environment in general can impact fluency, such as significant changes in routine, a fast-paced lifestyle, major life events, like the birth of new siblings, relatives visiting for a long period of time, a move, changes in a school, other things in the general environment like fatigue or conflict, thinking of sibling rivalry and sibling conflict at home. Likewise, factors in the communicative environment can also impact fluency. So these are any factors that increase the pressure or demand on a child's speech. Factors that can impact fluency include frequent interruptions, frequent direct questioning, fast-paced conversation and interaction, competition for talking time, any reactions to stuttering, verbal or nonverbal, that could be negatively perceived by the child. So, and also the factors in the communicative environment are the things that we are most likely to be able to influence. And again, no one factor is going to cause stuttering. Okay, so to build off of that, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the bucket analogy, which is a great way to visualize and think about some of the factors that Danielle just spoke to, including child factors, general factors in the environment, and also thinking about communication environments specifically. So if enough factors are present for a child over a period of time, then this may spill over into what we hear as stuttering. But there is no one factor that will cause a child to start stuttering 
And each of these factors is unique to each individual. So none of these factors are direct causes of stuttering and no two buckets will look exactly the same for each child who stutters. For this visual, it is the same factors that again, we just kind of talked about with Danielle. So possible child factors to consider, again, include family history of stuttering, possible speech and language challenges and temperament. Interpersonal factors, which is in the middle of the bucket here to consider, include major life changes and the communication environment and stressors at the top of the bucket must also be considered and could be negative responses from others regarding their stuttering or just general pressures in the environment. Now, many of these communication environments are natural or typical day-to-day -day interactions, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we want to take extra care in thinking about these factors when interacting with children who stutter. And this is not to say that all of these factors are true or present for all children who stutter, but it is critical to think about the whole child instead of just the stuttering behaviors that we hear and stuttering is no one's fault. All right. So as much as, as many as 80% of young people who begin to stutter ultimately will grow out of stuttering, which means there are about 20% of this population who will continue to stutter later in life amidst speech therapy. Uh, which we're referring to as uh, persistent stuttering. So it's stuttering that has not resolved spontaneously. So there are different factors that may predict persistent stuttering in children, and that's what this visual represents. So if we start from the left and kind of go to the right, the first risk factor is family history of stuttering. So almost half of the children who stutter have a family member who stutters. If the family member is still stuttering, there is increased risk of persistent stuttering, while there is less risk if the family member outgrew the stuttering as a child. For age at onset, children who begin stuttering before three and a half years old are more likely to outgrow it, when looking at time since onset, between 75 to 80% of children who begin stuttering stop between a year or two after they started stuttering. If a child has been stuttering for less than six months, they're more likely to outgrow it. Okay, so we're right here on the continuum, so I'll keep going. Um, so gender, females are more likely to outgrow stuttering than males. Research shows that this may be because of basic differences in male speech language abilities and differences in, other, um, in others' reactions to their stuttering. Children with few speech sound errors are more likely to outgrow stuttering while children with language delays or advanced language skills may be at more risk for persistent stuttering. Okay, so this is another statement um, that we would love to have your participation with for myth or fact. This statement reads saying slow down or relax does not always help. Give it a few more seconds before we close the poll. Okay, so um, as majority wrote, this is a fact. Um, so this is a suggestion that is often made with good intentions and is a natural response to show support for the child who stutters. 
But when people stutter, they feel like they've lost control of their speech mechanism. Therefore, telling a child to slow down or relax does not always help because the act of stuttering is not in a child's control. Even though saying slow down or relax doesn't always help, we understand why caregivers might take that approach. We don't want to see our children struggle, especially if we can't do anything to help them. And the good news is that there are ways to support young children who stutter without asking them to change the way they're talking. Since that can be frustrating, especially if they're already feeling negatively about the way they speak. If we think back to the bucket analogy that Courtney shared with us, Children who stutter tend to stutter more frequently if they feel pressure to communicate quickly, immediately, or at all. So our goal with young children who stutter is to reduce this communicative pressure and focus on reinforcing and easing their experience with talking. The way we do that is not by teaching them to talk differently, but rather by talking differently ourselves in a way that reduces the pressure. For example, reducing your own rate of talking can show your child how to take their time talking without you having to tell them directly and risking a negative experience. Reducing the frequency of your question asking, for example, what do you want for dinner? And instead offering comments or indirect questions like, I wonder what we'll have for dinner can invite your child to respond and reduce the pressure to do so immediately or at all. We can achieve reduced interruptions in conversation by showing a child how we take turns in conversation, even saying something like, oh, wow, you're doing such a great job waiting your turn to talk, or watch how I can wait my turn while you speak, can be really powerful reinforcing comments. A question we get a lot from parents is, can I talk to my child about stuttering? We want to know what you all think about this statement. So we'll do another poll. What do you think, myth or fact? It's okay to talk about stuttering. We'll give it a few more seconds before we close the poll. All right. So you all are on a roll. It absolutely is a fact that it is okay to talk to children about stuttering. And not only is it okay, but it can be a relief for young children who stutter to hear what it's called and hear other people talking about this experience that's going on in their brains and their bodies. And why is talking about stuttering with children so important? First of all, it normalizes stuttering for a child And it can also be a healthy way to acknowledge and celebrate that there are different ways of talking and there's no one right or wrong way. If your child is feeling like they do not talk the quote unquote right way because they stutter, talking to them about stuttering can be a way for us to reframe the idea of stuttering and help them understand that stuttering is not wrong, it's just different. In a lot of ways, talking about stuttering works at an individual level, supporting the individual who stutters, but it also works on a broader scale, working to break down the stigma of stuttering. It is something that can be talked about, and the more we do, the more we spread awareness and break down the barriers for our children who stutter. So when Jacqueline talks about breaking down the stigma of stuttering to support a child who stutters, we're also working on combating the fear of stuttering on the part of the child who stutters, and also the fear of the unknown on the part of the listener. So one analogy I like to use to understand this comes from Harry Potter. 
If you recall, Voldemort is the evil wizard that Harry is fighting throughout the series. However, most characters in the book call him he who shall not be named and are very fearful of naming him. In this case, not naming the thing that is feared or not talking about him actually makes him more powerful and increases the fear of him. This is similar to stuttering. If we do not name it or talk about it, we may increase the fear or misunderstandings around it, both for children who stutter and for those that don't stutter. You'll also remember that Harry and Professor Dumbledore use the name Voldemort from the beginning, and in doing so, demonstrate less fear of him and more ability to face their feelings and thoughts about him. He does not have as much power in this case, although he continues to exist. This is similar to stuttering in that naming stuttering and talking about it will reduce fear of it and likely increase a child's self-confidence in communication. This analogy only goes so far, mostly related to the fear of stuttering and why we feel it's a more helpful choice to name it. Where this analogy falls short a bit is that Voldemort is evil to the end, whereas while students may initially feel strongly about their stuttering, over time, one of our goals is to support a more objective and accepting view of it. So that being said, how do we talk to children about stuttering? So generally we use objective language versus rating the stuttering. So for example, we might hear it was a bad day or my child's stuttering was better this week or they had more trouble. These statements use more rating language, focus more on labeling the stuttering. So instead we might say, or it was a bad day, their stuttering was more frequent today or for they had more trouble, we might say they stuttered more or they were more frustrated. For stuttering was better this week, we might say, oh, their stuttering was less frequent. So again, it's about making it more neutral and objective instead of putting a judgment on it. And remembering that we wanna communicate stuttering just is. It is not good or bad, it is stuttering. Other, another thing we do is just acknowledge moments of stuttering, especially if a child seems frustrated and we want to validate their experience. So either by saying something like, hmm, you seem frustrated, or sometimes that happens and it's hard, or oh yeah, you, get, you did get stuck there. Sometimes talking is hard and I'm still listening. So we also just want to be aware of what the child might be feeling or showing and what we're feeling as well and potentially also not projecting our feelings onto them. So again, always our goal is communication and any way that we can reinforce that with our language. You, we could also say things like, you have such good ideas. I love your story. You really got your point across, regardless of their stuttering, whether they stuttered or not. And when we're looking at this goal, that relates a lot to what we're seeing as progress. So sure, we might wanna look at patterns of stuttering in a young child, but more important, we also wanna look at, are they participating and continuing to participate with others? Are they frustrated or not? And those are also measures of progress. So we've talked a lot about the development of stuttering in the early childhood years and ways we can support a child who stutters in this age group. It's important to know, like Courtney said, that for about 80% of children who develop stuttering in these early childhood years, it will go on to resolve either on its own or with some therapy. However, there is a percentage of children for which it will continue into the school age and adolescent years and beyond. So again, we're gonna shift to talking more about the school age and adolescent considerations, and we're not going to talk as much about stuttering in adulthood during this talk. So we talked previously about factors that might, might raise a child's risk of persisting. <clears throat> but other than that, we don't have a single way to guarantee or predict with absolute certainty for whom it will resolve and for whom it will not. Although there is a lot we can do to support in the environment to increase the likelihood. Generally, the longer stuttering persists, the less likely it is to resolve. So what might this experience be like for a school age or adolescent student? So right now we're gonna actually hear from some of them, students who stutter. I, I, I 
and I substitute fries for t tater tots. Do you have this in a s s size eight and a half? I, 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 excuse me, I, I, I'm looking for the, the b b b bathroom. Uh, are you guys hiring? We are. I'll grab you an application. So think for a minute about what this brings up for you. What we want to highlight is this feeling that many children who stutter can have about always being on stage, where everyone is looking at them and noticing their stutter in everyday interactions that those of us who don't stutter may not realize. During school age and adolescence, many feelings can develop depending on each student's experience with communication in a variety of situations with different audiences. The other thing that may have stood out to you and definitely stood out to me when I watched this was the impact of the listener's reaction and the impact that it can have on that feeling and the interaction. So at the end, when the cashier was waiting and responding in a normal way, that definitely impacted how that student must feel in that interaction. Okay, so within these age groups, there are different considerations that are specific uh, to school age and adolescent children, the first being persistence. So as we discussed previously, the longer stuttering continues, the less likely it is to resolve, though it is not necessarily tied to a certain age. So in turn, the children who are within these age groups have often experienced stuttering for an extended period of time. Therefore, more avoidance behaviors can surface, which we'll explore further on the next slide. But there are many factors to consider that may contribute to avoidance at this age. So just thinking about school age and adolescent children, they are involved in a variety of different environments more extensively. So they're spending a good amount of their day at school. They also spend time at home with their family and often are getting involved with other activities within their wider community. And in these different contexts that arise in situations, it may lead to an increased fear of the moment of stuttering which may lead to more avoidance. And some of the situations could even involve possible teasing or bullying. Stuttering and anxiety can overlap, but it's not the cause of stuttering and that doesn't always happen. People who stutter often try to avoid stuttering, perhaps by trying to speak quickly, by forcing their way through moments of stuttering, or just by not speaking at all when they fear they might stutter. And in turn, these behaviors can actually increase the likelihood that more stuttering will result and lead to a greater impact of stuttering on a person's life. And we think that this is a nice visual to dive a little bit further into the multifaceted experience that is stuttering created by Dr. Joseph Sheehan in 1970. And it really conceptualizes stuttering as an iceberg. So above the surface, there are stuttering behaviors that we see and that we hear during conversation with a person who stutters that we explored earlier. However, there's an even bigger part of the stuttering experience that lives below the surface, including thoughts and different feelings associated with speech or stuttering that could lead to some of the avoidance that we've been talking about. So when looking above the surface here, secondary behaviors are not the stuttering itself, but our natural reactions or behaviors that develop over time, really in response to that moment of stuttering. So children may try to escape moments of stuttering, 
by using certain behaviors or try to avoid the moments altogether. And there's really a great level of attention and energy that's required to do this. Secondary behaviors can occur before, during, or after stuttering. And sometimes they're conscious behaviors that have been implemented for a variety of reasons, but sometimes they're also subconscious. When exploring under the surface, there are many thoughts, feelings, and emotions that people who stutter may experience that can impact their quality of life and participation in daily activities, leading to increased avoidance. These under the surface experiences are truly unique to each, each individual and must be examined to better understand that person's experience with stuttering and its impact. Okay. So this is another statement that we want to open up to everybody to decide if it's myth or fact. So the statement reads, stuttering is caused by feeling anxious or nervous. So if you could take a second to answer that poll, that would be great. Give it a few more seconds before we close the poll. Okay. Well, it's interesting to see. So this one seems kind of split evenly between the two. Um, and this is a tricky one because the cause of stuttering is not, um, the stuttering is not caused by that nervous or anxious feeling, but because fluent speakers become more disfluent when they're nervous or under stress, it's a common assumption that people who stutter do so for the same reason. So while people who stutter may feel nervous or anxious because they stutter, nervousness is not the cause of stuttering. And in this school age age group, we also have to consider day-to-day -day situational impact. We think of the term situational fear. And a way to conceptualize this, I want you all to take a moment to think to yourself, is there a situation in which you feel especially confident talking? Maybe it's talking to your loved ones or a pet or even to yourself in the mirror. And then what about the opposite? Is there a situation in which you feel especially nervous or fearful talking? Maybe standing in front of a crowd and giving a speech. So for those who stutter, situational fears can be amplified by the stress surrounding talking in general. And we often use this visual of a ladder to help us understand the different varieties and hierarchy of situational fear. It's important for us to consider the situational fear because it might lead to avoidance or an increase in stuttering depending on the situation. For example, in speaking situations at the top of the ladder with high fear, there might be more avoidance, more stuttering, less stuttering. And then vice versa for those at the bottom, there might be less fear, more comfort, maybe less avoidance and impact, but there also might be either less or more stuttering. On this slide as well, you'll see a note about bullying. And for school-aged children, it is a topic that can link to situational fear and avoidance. So we want to be thoughtful of some ways on how to support a child who stutters, who might be at an increased risk of bullying at school. And if you are concerned or if your child brings up concern about the impact of stuttering at school, for example, maybe not wanting to raise their hand to participate, feeling too nervous to give a presentation, maybe there is bullying going on, you do have some options to support your child. You can choose to collaborate with your child's school team, and you'll see some examples of those team members here. And you can work either to set up some accommodations for your child, such as increased time to read aloud in class or a cue from the teacher that their turn is coming up instead of just doing it on the fly. 
Another option you have is to request a school evaluation and potentially have your child receive services, special education services, to increase the supports at school, such as counseling, speech therapy, or otherwise. We want you to ask yourself the question, ask your child the question, even if they're doing fine in school, grades are okay, they're not getting calls home, what does their participation look like? Are there challenging emotions around talking at school? Since stuttering can be an invisible challenge because of avoidance, we wanna make sure that children know their options and that the school knows that they're responsible to support a child who's struggling, even if it's not as visible as it might be for other students. So in School Age and Beyond, our goal as caregivers, teachers, speech therapists, or other professionals working with a child who stutters is always to reduce the impact of stuttering, not to reduce the stuttering. And why is that? So when we focus on reducing the impact of stuttering versus the frequency of it, it's been shown that we often increase participation and decrease avoidance. We improve self-concept, we promote self-advocacy and improve quality of life overall that's long lasting. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't work on any tools to manage stuttering, but that's an individual decision and not the primary goal. So we also sometimes see that focusing on reducing the impact through these other means can result in reduced stuttering or anxiety around stuttering. So how do we reduce this impact? We reduce it by changing the relationship with stuttering and supporting students with this who stutter and ourselves by doing the following things, by spreading awareness about stuttering through sharing information with others informally or more formally, encouraging self-disclosure and letting others know they stutter as they become more comfortable with it, creating an open dialogue about stuttering. And there is a powerful role of groups in meeting other children who stutter because oftentimes children who stutter feel like they're alone and they're the only ones who do this. And finally, we also encourage the use of mindfulness techniques, which have been shown to provide many benefits when applied to stuttering. Um, so the previously discussed ideas are ways that we can all support children who stutter, especially once they reach school age. Now a child may also be participating in speech therapy for stuttering. We also wanna give you information on what are considered to be less effective and more effective goals. So if you're a caregiver or work in a school, it's helpful to be able to look at goals with a more critical eye. So goals that are less effective include goals only related to increasing fluency or reducing stuttering as they lead to avoiding stuttering and less generalization. So these goals might sound like a student will increase their fluency to 80% fluent utterances in a conversation or something like that. More effective goals include those aimed at increasing confidence, reducing impact and accepting or understanding stuttering, such as things like a student will share five facts about stuttering with a person of their choice, or they'll self-disclose stuttering to another person of their choice and things like that. School presentations about stuttering are also things that we sometimes work with students on to share information and increase confidence. So why is increasing fluency not the goal? And why is reducing stuttering not the goal? Because when fluency or reducing stuttering is the goal, we are inadvertently sending the message that their message, their, the student's message, is only valid if they can say it fluently or reduce their stuttering, and that often does more harm than good. So I think in the interest of time, we won't open this as a poll, but I'm just gonna produce this as just the myth or fact question. Um, being bilingual causes stuttering. So that is a myth, but it's often one that comes up in our work, but there's no evidence to support this myth that bilingualism causes stuttering. However, there's evidence to support that bilingualism has many cognitive benefits. So there's also evidence to support bilingual children are at risk of being over-identified for stuttering, but there is no evidence to support that being bilingual causes stuttering. And just to jump off what uh, Danielle was talking about, so there's a lot of clinical research that's being developed in this area, um, but it's important to note that bilingual children exhibit a higher number of disfluencies or interruptions in their speech overall. Uh, and these can come in the form of repetitions and they might experience a higher number of these repetitions. So even though certain repetitions at the word level are considered to be stutter-like, 
For bilingual children, these repetitions are not necessarily characteristic of stuttering and do not connote a stuttering diagnosis for a bilingual child. So it's really important that we think about other factors, like if there's tension in their speech, um, if they're experiencing a sound getting stuck or stretched out across languages, including their dominant or native language, as well as elevated thoughts and feelings about their speech that could impact participation. So our biggest concern and one of the things we think a lot about that we consider is that we don't want bilingual children to be over identified as people who stutter. So I know we're up against the time, but I know we've uh, talked a lot of different information today, but these are the biggest takeaways that we want you to walk away with. Uh, stuttering is okay. Young children who stutter may stop on their own. Um, the impact of stuttering on daily life is more important than what the stuttering actually sounds like. The goal of speech therapy is to really um, increase self-confidence and um, a sense of self and that there's a wide circle of support both in school and outside of school. We want to leave you with some resources here that you can look at for advocacy and groups uh, for other children who stutter, as well as some books and research. And thank you. Thank you so much. We do have a question in the chat if you have a minute to respond to that. Um, we have a participant who is citing a research that has been published in New England Journal of Medicine and other um, journals where they have found stuttering behavior has a physical, rhythmical, and or genetic basis leading to abnormal speech muscle contractions. Um, so in other words, physical components can override environmental variables. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, thank you for bringing up that research. Um, I guess I would say that we do know that there is a lot of research supporting you know, the speech and motor abilities as a definite factor and that at its basis, really stuttering is a biological issue. However, I would still caution around discounting the environment completely because we also see that um, in situations where a child might have these speech and motor and the muscle contractions and the difficulty that might be found in the research, that potentially in certain environments and modifying the environment can still make an impact on that child. So I guess that would be where the take I would have on it, not having potentially read that whole current research. Thank you. And I know we are at time before we end today's session. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Thank you all just for being a part of this and uh, hearing our perspective. Thank you so much. And you had shared some wonderful resources at the end of the presentation. So if anyone is interested in the resource list, feel free to email the Blum Center at pflc at partners.org. We'd be happy to share those with you. Uh, thank you so much for attending. This session is being recorded. If you're interested in viewing the recording, it'll be made available on the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Have you. a lovely rest of the day.